have been studying and emphasizing that the theme of this book is in Christ. Paul writes to the Ephesians church, which is both a Gentile and a Jewish church, to tell them how they're supposed to get along together because they're in Christ. He writes to let them know that Christ tore down the middle wall of partition. All the laws that separated the Gentiles from the Jews was fulfilled in Christ and therefore they can come together in the body of Christ. He also kind of put a needle into their balloon when he said that Gentiles and Jews are equal. Because the Jews had gone through so many centuries as the God of people. And that the only way that anybody could know God was to become a Jew. And if you didn't become a Jew, you were called a God-fearer. But it also meant you couldn't get into where the teachings were. And so when we look at this today, in the 20, and I guess we're probably now about in the 21st century, right? Is that where we're at? I can't keep up with these centuries. I wasn't born in most of them. But in whichever century we are in, it's God's message to us. Don't show respect of person one above another. Everybody in the church deserves the same honor and the same respect. Amen? Amen. And when we come into the church, everything we brought with us, all those other names and categories we like to call ourselves sometimes, we leave them outside the church because in here we are Christians. Amen? Amen. In here we are Christians. Born again by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. We're going to continue with Paul's practical application of the teachings he presented to us in to the Ephesians church. Remember we started uh, concerning, in particular in chapter 4, him applying what he has told us concerning the coming of Christ and concerning us of being in Christ. Now he's telling us how we're supposed to behave as Christians. Amen? Now, hopefully that Christianity has been around long enough that folks shouldn't have to be told how to be Christians. They had to be told back then because the Gentiles never saw a Christian that they couldn't kill. They were opponents to the state religion of worshiping the emperor. They had set up and believed that Jesus Christ was their king above Caesar. And so the Roman Empire saw them as a threat that if they didn't put them down this thing called the way, they might rise up and fight against the Roman Empire. The Jewish church felt the same way. That if they didn't put down this called the way, where Jesus Christ was the leader, the temple might close up. And they may lose their prestige. They might leave their way of living. Everyone knows, and Pilate perceived it, Jesus was delivered to him by the religious leaders because of envy. Not because of anything he had done. Not because of any crime he had committed. In fact, the Jewish courts had to get false witnesses to come together at a mock trial, what we call a kangaroo trial, to convict him, to bring him to Pilate. Now, had they been allowed, they would have took Jesus out and stoned them. And they weren't allowed to do that. So they bring him to Pilate so Pilate can dirty his hands. And so the Roman government can be the ones to say they crucified Christ. Isn't it interesting how even in all those times, God makes His message true. Because in Hebrew, in Greek, and in Latin, a sign was put above Christ Jesus said the King of the Jews. So that everybody that was in that place at that time could read this is the king of the Jews. 
Pilate recognized who he was. Although he didn't turn in faith to the Lord as far as we know, he knew that this was a righteous man and that he was going to wash his hands of the whole thing. But you folks, listen. Just because some folks wash their hands or something doesn't mean they have unclean hands. Pilate's hands were still dirty with the blood of Jesus. So when we see this this morning, we see him telling us, even down here in the 21st century, how we're supposed to behave in the church because God knew, because we were still in the flesh, and that we were still putting down that old Adamic nature, that there might be these problems even in the church today. And so the Word of God comes to us today to tell us how we are supposed to interact as Christians. In the passage before us, this is what we need to understand. Christ has given apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to the church to enable the body of Christ to grow up to maturity in Christ. These offices are still manifested today. And I'll let you know as we look at it. But these offices that Jesus set up for the church are still manifested, although we don't call in the evangelical church people apostles and we don't call them prophets. We do use the word evangelist and we do use the word pastor and we do use the word teacher. But instead of apostle, we use the word church planner. Missionary. <clears throat> and prophet, well, we haven't dealt with that in the evangelical church. But there are times that a man or a woman so anointed of God and moved by God, God moves on them to speak a word from Him to calm a situation. I was at a church business meeting years ago. And you would think that you should never be concerned about people coming to blows in a church. You, know, you don't go to church to see a boxing match or a wrestling match. Or at least I don't. And they had got so heated over something that was just plain stupid. And suddenly, a man stands up. Fortunately, God knows who he picks. He had a man stand up whom was respected by everybody in the church. And it wasn't a pastor. It was a person in the laity. And he stood up and spoke the word that God gave him and it was like he poured a bucket of water on a bunch of dogs fighting. They went down. It settled down. And there was peace. Now in my belief, that, that man acted as a prophet. Because he spoke the Word of God to the people of God. And if you know anything about the prophets in the Testament, they separated themselves from the priests because they spoke for God to the people. The priest, on the other hand, spoke to the people from God. In other words, they interpreted the Word. They taught. But the prophets were the ones that God would send with either words of encouragement or words of judgment. It kind of always fell in that two places. And so as we look at this morning, let's look at what is the origin of these gifts that Jesus sent. Starting with verse 7. But in every one of you is given the grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive, and he gave gifts unto men. Now he that ascended, what is it? But that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Here's why. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the sight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love 
may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. The origin of the gifts. When we look at this, it has two understandings. When it talks about Jesus ascending and descending, it is a reference to first that He descended from heaven and took upon Him this body of flesh. He became a man and He dwelt among us. He lived. He ministered. He died. He was put in the grave. The grave couldn't hold Him. And on the third day, He arose. And He ascended to sit at the right hand of the Father 40 days later. But that's one part of it. He ascended as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And He sat down at the right hand of power to make intercession for you and I. He's our advocate. But before He did that, although His body was wrapped in linen cloths lying in the grave, His spirit and soul were very busy. The body says He descended into the lower parts of the earth. He went down to where Hades and Abraham's bosom was. Remember, before Jesus came and arose from the dead, when people died in the faith, they went to Abraham's bosom. Remember how uh, Jesus telling the story concerning Lazarus and Dives? Lazarus was in Abraham's bosom, but Dives looked up, being in torments, and asked to have some water put on his tongue. And the stuff was there was a great gulf. So in the center of the earth back then, there was a place for the unbelieving dead. And they went immediately there, called Hades. Sheol was the grave. Three words that the Jews used in reference to to hell. Sheol, the grave. Hades, that part that was in the center of the earth and still is. And then Gehenna, the lake of fire. And Gehenna comes as a lake of fire because there was a garbage dump. We call them landfills today. But they had a garbage dump and it burned continuously with fire. When you looked out there, there was always a fire going on. And so when they used the term Gehenna, it was to bring to mind that that person would be in a fire that would never cease. It would eternally continue on and on and on. Now folks, I want to tell you, some people don't want to believe in hell. Some people don't want to believe in in the fire. But if my Lord says there's a hell and there's fire, I believe it. There's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. Amen? Amen. And it takes an idiot to tell her they ain't afraid of hell. I'm afraid of it. Amen? Amen. But I'm looking forward to being in heaven. Amen. I'm looking forward to that which was created for me. God created heaven for us. But the Bible says He created hell for the devil and his angels. Nowhere does it say He created hell for us. That was created in His image. When man goes to hell, he goes there as an interloper. He goes there because he failed to get on the only way to God, and that was Jesus Christ. And folks, let me tell you, there's only one way. There's many religions, but there's only one way to God, and that's through Jesus Christ. That's through the blood. Amen? Amen. And I hope nobody gets upset that I preach about the blood, but I still believe the blood still has its power. I still believe the blood cleanses us from sin. I still believe the blood will sustain us and keep us when the devil attacks us. Amen? Amen. I still believe in the power of the blood. So, in verse 8, it speaks of Christ's ascension to heaven, bringing with Him the saints of God who has died in the faith prior to Christ's death and resurrection. Why would Jesus need to go down there? Remember, the people who died in the faith were still looking for the Messiah. God promised them one. But they hadn't seen Him. But they died in the faith believing it. That a Messiah was coming. The ones who didn't believe and died anyway, God had a message for them. Jesus went down into Abraham's bosom and showed them, I'm the Messiah. I'm the one that you believed in. Now your faith is reality. 
And you're not going to stay here because when I ascend to heaven, I'm taking you back with me. When Jesus Christ arose on that third day, the Scripture indicates about 500 graves also broke open. And they arose from the dead. And they walked around Jerusalem bearing witness. Amen. One of these days, if we die before He comes, our grave will burst open. And we will come up out of that grave. Amen. But if not, listen. Listen. We got the both best of both worlds. If we die, we're going to raise up. But if we're walking this earth, there's going to come a shout from heaven and the trump of God. And we all shall be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. This corruption shall put on incorruption. This mortality shall put on immortality. And we shall be changed. Amen. Amen. And we'll be caught up, snatched up to meet the Lord in the air. Praise God. That's His first coming. At His first coming, He doesn't put His feet on the earth. He just captures the church. But his second coming, he puts his feet on the Mount of Olives. And he splits in two. That's when he comes to do old Satan the final job. Amen. Amen. But here, remember how it was told that that old snake would <coughs> bruise his heel? Mm-hmm. But that he would crush the head of the snake? Mm-hmm. Jesus went down into Abraham's bosom to clean it out. But he went down into Hades to seal the fate of everybody who was there because they failed to believe in walking faith. So part of torment for them will be and is they had an opportunity and they didn't take it. And a lot of times, hell for a lot of folks is going to be the eternity eternity, that they had the opportunity to accept Jesus Christ and they chose to not to do it. And I want to tell you, in hell, people still have their consciousness. Because a rich man in hell lifted up his eyes and said, I am burning this torment. He felt the fire. He felt the dryness on his tongue and he wished that he could just get a fingertip of water on his tongue. Yeah, they're going to know. They're going to be biting each other where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. There will be darkness. Do you know how depressed you get when you sit in a room that's just plain dark? When the power goes off, and, you know, before you get those candles, if you don't get them real quick? How the darkness makes you depressed? Can you imagine an eternity and darkness and depression and no way out? That's why, while we breathe, let us serve the Lord. While we breathe, let us tell others that Jesus is alive and He will make us alive and He will give us joy and hope and peace and comfort. All we got to do is love Him and serve Him. And let listen, we give up sin, folks. That's how you give up. You don't give up anything else. You give up sin. How many of us really want to put around this old sin anyway? This old nasty stuff. Amen. It ain't better when we just give it to the Lord. Amen. But you know one thing we do do? What we need to kind of look almost as dirty as sin? That's hanging on to our cares. Just walking around with our cares and never giving them to Jesus. And they act like shackles on us. And they eat at our faith. Because why ain't God answering? Well, we had not prayed yet. Notice the Scripture says... Casting all your cares upon Him, for He cares for you. That word means casting is like chunking it. Throw it away. Throw that, get that care off of you. Just like you put your sins on Jesus, put your care on Jesus. And when you put your care on Jesus, guess what God does? God speaks peace to your mind. So that you know that whatever your care is, God is about to supply it. Amen. God is going to heal that body. God is going to make those finances stretch. Amen. Have you ever been there where your pennies kind of you have stretched them a little bit? And yet, at the end of the month, the penny got stretched. Amen. 
God supplied the need just like he seemed like. So, he goes down and he tells them, when he comes up, he brings back the believers and they know they have their Messiah. That's why now, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Today, your body gets placed in a casket or it gets cremated. Some folks do cremation. One way or the other. But the moment you give that last breath, that breath that God gave you, that breath goes to God. Your spirit and soul goes to God. In that instant. In that instant. So what happened to Hades? Well, Isaiah tells us that hell hath enlarged its borders. Don't you know that physics tells us there's no such thing as a vacuum? You dig dirt, and you say, oh, well, that, that holds vacuum. No, because air just went back in there. It filled itself with air. So when Jesus took out Abraham's bosom, guess what happened? Hell enlarged itself and took up the space. What I know is this. Jesus got me a way out. And I'm going to walk on that way out. Until I see Him in glory. Amen. Now, Paul uses Psalm 68.18. And in Psalm 68.18, it talks about God coming. And He's coming to His throne. And that throne is Jerusalem. And what it indicates is God is coming as a conqueror. And He's coming to sit up upon His people. And when He's coming, He's conquered all their enemies and He gives them the spoils. What this means is Jesus went down into hell, crushed the head of the serpent, for if the princes of this world had known they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. They didn't know what they were doing. What they did was they released the power of God. There's power in that old cross. Amen. Amen. Some people look at it gloomily, but there's power in that old cross. Amen. And it's empty because Jesus ain't on it. The manger's empty. The cross is empty. The grave is empty. Amen. But heaven's getting full of a lot of good Christians. Amen. So, when we see Him defeating the devil, what does He do? As He ascends, He gives gifts unto me. Now, the first gifts that we're talking about today are called administrative gifts or leadership gifts. They are gifts given to individuals in the body of Christ to lead the body in faith and to keep the body in faith. Okay? So when we look at this, and notice, he doesn't say that a separation of clergy like we do. See, we separate clergy. We make the pastor the cleric. Other people, lay people. But in the early church, and we'll see in just a minute, the people that are called laity were being used of these gifts. Let's look at this. The proclamation of the gifts. Paul tells us in verse 7 that but unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. God gives each of us grace in order to manifest these gifts, to be used of these gifts. There is a dispensation of grace given to each of us to win the lost at any cost. Our co-worker, our family member, our enemy, they're in our dispensation. And we are supposed to try to win them for Jesus Christ. When we do that, when we bear witness, we become an evangelist. Let's look at this. Apostle, the word apostle comes from two words. Apo and stelos. And it means one sent with a message. The prime example of that we look at an apostle is the apostle Paul. 
He was the apostle to the Gentiles. And Paul's mission was planting churches. Even the disciples who were called apostles, their initial work was planting churches. Building up the body of Christ. And so today, and of course if you read, people talk about Paul's missionary journeys. Okay. Did you know that missio, the word that we get mission from, also means one sin? A missionary is sent from a church under the authority of the church to plant a church and win people for Christ. An apostle that the Bible talks about and we call missionaries or church planters is one called from God to go forth and to build churches. Build up the body of Christ. That's what an apostle does. A prophet is one who stands with a message from God to the people of God. Such a one in the New Testament was Agabus. Do you remember him? God told Agabus to go down to the street called Straight. He'd find there Saul, which becomes Paul. He was supposed to heal Saul because he was blinded on the road to Damascus. And then tell Paul, you are called to be an apostle to the Gentiles. Can you imagine an Orthodox Jew being told he's supposed to go win the Gentiles for Jesus? Can you imagine how that feel? It took God. And it took a prophet that Paul understood. You see, we've allowed these terms to go out of, out of sense. And some people have said, well, that was for those days. No, folks. Jesus Christ is saying yesterday, today, and for me forever. The same gifts He gave back then are the same gifts we have today in these administrative gifts for the church. We still need church planners. We still need people at times when God moves upon them to stand up and give us a word from God. And then the next one He says is an evangelist. The word evangelist comes from the word evangelion. means the good news. An evangelist was sent out by the church to preach the good news. And his purpose was to win people to Jesus Christ. Now, in our churches today, it's kind of got a little different. We don't normally refer to them as evangelists. Now they're referred to as revivalists. They bring people come to bring revival to the church. And one of the products of a revival sometimes is people getting saved. Some still use evangelist as a term, but most of them are referred to as revivalists. So either term works, and it still happens today. And that day we can take Stephen was an evangelist. Philip was an evangelist and began a great revival in Samaria. And when he got the revival going, guess what? The head honchos in the head church, Peter. <laughs> he had to come down and take over. So Philip went on again, and Peter took over the Samaritan revival. So when we look at this, he finally gives us what we know about. General. Pastors and teachers. The one of a pastor is to give pastoral care to the body of Christ. It's to take care of the sheep. Some churches call their pastors shepherds. And people who he appoints are called under shepherds. In Kim's church in South Korea, they do what they call sale churches. <laughs> that is, they have ten members that start a work in their home. An under shepherd is appointed over them. And they reach people for Jesus Christ. And then they come together on Sunday in the church. And the church that he has is way beyond 100,000 now. And it grew from that point. Today we've got some churches in America that are doing that. They're having home sale groups where people are coming together in their homes and their apartments and they're doing Bible studies, and then they bring those people to church. And that's a great way to evangelize. Great way to win people to Jesus. 
And so we have pastors. Timothy and Titus are two examples of pastors. Paul writes to Timothy as a young pastor who was timid because the older people in the church didn't respect his age. And so Paul writes to tell them that God did not give him a spirit of independence, but a power and a love and a sound mind. In other words, don't let those old heads in the church despise your youth. Your God called preach. Amen? And it's sad to say today, young ministers still have a hard time getting going. Getting to churches. Because everybody, of course, wants the older pastor. And that's cool. That's cool. But when a church gets to a certain point, they need to bring in some of these young people, these young pastors. Otherwise, they go out and they multiply problems because they don't know how to address it. In other words, we don't know, need to throw our young ministers out there to the wolves. They need to be guided and helped and watch the old pastor and see some of the things go wrong. <laughs> and then there are teachers. Teachers are those that are gifted by God to instruct in the church. They are to instruct the Word of God. And some of them can even go uh, out into auditoriums and stuff and teach as a teacher there. You're not stopped at being a teacher just in the church. You can be a teacher in a Sunday school class. You can be a teacher uh, in a conference. This is what God's put in the church. Why did He put them in the church? Here's the purpose of the gifts. For the perfecting of the saints, to grow the saints up. That's their purpose. Those five administrative gifts are to grow the saints up. 